My name is Dr. Hannah Marshall. I'm one of the critical care specialists here at Dove Lewis. And today we are going to be talking about my patient here, Freya, who we think is dealing with tetanus. So tetanus is something that um, while we hear about in many different ways is quite rare in our cat and dog species. So something that you may or may not see throughout the entirety of your career or may see only once or twice. Uh, tetanus itself is a type of bacteria. Um, it lives in the soil. It's quite endemic throughout the world and it's an opportunistic type infection. So the the uh, ways it's going to enter the body and cause issues with our patients is going to be through some type of wound. Uh, the transit time and onset of clinical signs is highly variable, um, but it's usually at least days to maybe even up to two weeks from the time of exposure to when they may develop signs. And a lot of that is going to be based on the location of the wound and where the entry to the body is and the distance it needs to travel up the axons to affect the um, central nervous system. Uh, tetanus itself is a gram positive positive anaerobe type bacteria, and it produces a neurotoxin that's going to be causing a lot of the central nervous and neurologic signs that we deal with within these patients. Um, it is a type of toxin that will bind irreversibly to these neuromuscular junction receptors, and it affects your inhibitory neurons, and so it prevents glycine and GABA interactions um, at the neurotransmitter, and as a result, is going to cause hyperexcitability and a lot of the uh, muscle contraction issues that we see in our patients. Uh, normally, we don't see this in our cats and dogs because dogs and cats are highly resistant to this sort of infection, even though they likely have different versions of exposure based on um, where it lives in the environment. Cats are significantly more resistant than dogs, so our dog species are going to be more common compared to the two, uh, but horses and humans are much more susceptible to this type of infection compared to cats and dogs. Um, in Freya's case here, we suspect she sustained um, the, either a wound to her back nail. So on her back foot, she has a broken nail that happened about two weeks ago. She also had a little swollen toe on her left front foot that could have been a potential source as well. Um, the most important thing is to trying to identify the source because you want to try to debride or flush out the tissue if there is signs of um, active infection within there, just to help control local disease as much as possible. Um, when we see tetanus, there are two different flavors that you might deal with. There could be a really localized type of infection, or there could be a more generalized type of infection. Uh, the generalized infection is going to be much more common in our species, um, which is what we're um, dealing with with Freya here. Uh, the localized infection may only be on one limb or related to that limb that had the initial source. Um, but again, most of the time you will see things pretty widespread throughout their nervous system. Um, the way we diagnose this is mostly through our clinical signs. So you can technically grow Clostridium spores on a culture, but it's at least two weeks since it is an anaerobe. And the uh, um, ability to grow it is pretty low. So it's a probably pretty low yield culture when you're trying to do it that way. So it's mostly based on identification of the clinical signs as well as finding a wound um, to find the actual input source. Um, so in Freya, she's demonstrating a fair amount of the clinical signs we would expect. So big things you're looking for is going to be really intense hyperreflexive muscles. Um, they have this really stiff gait when they're moving. You'll see kind of this really big push and marked um, extension and rigidity of the limbs. You can see some dorsal flexion of the tail itself and when she walks it has a, a little more lift to it than it should normally as you can see right there. Um, one of the other big clinical signs is going to be related to their face. So they can get basically what we call a rhesus sardonicus. So it's this very surprised look that you can see on her face. Um, so we see the really tightening of her muscles, this really tight pull of her ears. We see the pull um, right at her eyes, and then you'll see some elevation of the third eyelid as well. Um, she can still blink her eyes, um, but she will use her third eyelids to protect her eyes a little bit more right now. Uh, they can also sustain a lock jaw. So essentially, um, one big thing we're looking for is their ability to eat while they recover from this infection, mostly because their ability to open their mouth is quite reduced. So hers is not too bad. She can actually open it somewhat, um, especially enough to eat food, which is going to be really important in our nursing and overall therapy, as well as um, expectations for these patients. So overall, while she is demonstrating generalized signs of tetanus right now, um, she does seem to have some mild 
signs and is uh, responding quite well to our medical therapy overall. Um, so when we are treating these guys, there's a couple things that we need to address and think about overall. So the first thing, as I said before, is really good source control of your infection point and trying to identify those wounds. So her front digit that we were worried about appears very clean with no signs of infection or tissue necrosis. Her back nail um, that had a little bit more crusting around it, we cleaned up very well at her admin yesterday. Um, the next step is going to be initiating antibiotic therapy for uh, the actual Clostridium organism itself. So the classic treatment is going to be penicillin G. However, metronidazole is thought to be more efficacious in treating the actual infection, uh, but they are at a little risk of metronidazole toxicity because it is a higher dose and a little more frequent. So she is on a 10 mg per kg dose every eight hours right now. So we watch for the neurotoxic effects of that drug independently. Um, the other treatments we consider would be muscle relaxers, looking for anti-seizure medications if they are developing things like seizures. Um, she is currently on an oral diazepam as well as oral methocarbamol. Um, you can use both injectably, especially if they cannot open their mouth or take oral pills. Uh, we are treating her with a slurry feeding. Um, since I said, like I said, she is able to eat some food, but since her consistency and ability to chew is going to be reduced, we don't want to offer her anything too firm or hard or that she could potentially choke on. Uh, when they have more intensive types of signs, these animals can actually uh, need requirements like mechanical ventilation if their respiratory muscles are contracting too hard where they can't actually um, have a normal respiratory rate. They are actually at risk of things like aspiration pneumonia as well because they can develop a mega esophagus related to the neuromuscular dysfunction going on. Um, they may need intensive nursing care if they can't stand or rotate themselves on their own. Really severely affected animals will have the um, pretty profound extensor rigidity in all limbs to the point where they may not be able to stand up or move themselves on their own at all. Um, if they ha are having more severe effects, there's a couple additional medications right now um, that we can give in order to try and reduce toxin as well as um, reduce the, the abnormal functions that's going on at the junction. So there is a tetanus um, antitoxin that does exist. Uh, she did not receive it in this treatment protocol um, for a couple different reasons. So the, the tetanus antitoxin um, in the reports that have been done has not shown to improve survival in patients that did and did not receive it. Uh, and it comes with some risk. So it can cause some anaphylaxis or pretty severe allergic reactions because they are not dog specific products. They're actually either equine or human based serum products. And so it does take some testing with um, small quantities to start with to make sure they don't have any true allergic reactions prior to administering. Um, but since her signs were not too severe and she could continue to eat and walk on her own, we elected to hold on administering antitoxin to her at admission. Uh, you can also use magnesium sulfate uh, in order to reduce the uh, GABA or the lack of GABA activity and to help their actual muscular function. Um, they can be at risk for magnesium toxicity as well. Um, the fun trick when you're giving them a magnesium CRI is to monitor their patellar reflex. And if they lose their patellar reflex, then that is the first sign you're going to see with the actual toxicity overall. Um, she, again, has not required that therapy thus far, um, just with her uh, good response to our medications. Um, since she was admitted about 24 hours ago uh, at rest, we see her ears beginning to relax a little more. She is able to fold her limbs and curl herself into a little ball. And so we're going to continue our treatments in hospital likely for another 24 hours and then try to discharge her. Uh, Long-term expectations are variable, again, based on how affected they are. So if they are severely affected, they, they are potentially um, able to die from this sort of disease, again, mostly related to their loss of respiratory function or um, compromise related to that. Um, most signs are likely going to last anywhere from one to four weeks after the infection arises. And and um, we're just are expecting a slow reduction of the stiffness, um, kind of return to normal appearance of her ears and face. And we do the nursing support as needed throughout that time. Um, there are some thoughts that even up to a few months after infection or throughout their life, you may see some very intermittent spastic movements to them as far as the only long-term sequelae that could occur. But in theory, she should be able to uh, have a complete recovery from this sort of infection. Um, but she will have this little surprise look to her face probably at least for the next week, if not a little bit more. So thank you for listening to this little brief talk on tetanus. Like we said, this is quite a rare 
finding that we see in animals in the hospital situation. So it's always exciting to see it live action, especially in a patient that is not uh, showing severe effects and we have a really good expected prognosis for her. Uh, so thank you, Freya, for showing us something really classic and interesting that we may not see too often.